it's as simple as that because if you understand it that way you can look at the board and maybe understand its design. You can stand on a wave and perhaps understand your role and you can definitely walk away with a memory if you apply both those things. You want to surf better? Learn to knit. I'm fascinated by what I've learned only because of what I could learn next, not how much I know. If I forget what I'm writing within a few waves of a session, that's a good one. Welcome back to the show. That was a couple of quotes from today's guest, Donald Brink. And the music on the intro and outro today is an original piece from a surfer and listener, Isabel B., on Instagram at Izzy Out of Space. It's I Z Z Y Out of Space. The surf trip in September with Taylor Knox and Matt Griggs. We still have a couple of spots left. Email me, Mike at Surf Mastery. If you're interested and if you want more details, there's also more details on my Instagram page as well. Also looking to do a seminar on surfing and training for surfing in Los Angeles. So if there's anyone interested as a participant or a presenter or perhaps even a, a venue host, please email me, Mike, at Surf Mastery. A lot of positive feedback from the previous show with Devin Howard. And yes, there will be a lot more longboarding stuff in future. Some of you have suggested some shorter episodes, and yes, they are coming. But today's episode is a long-form interview slash conversation and it's actually the longest one I've done. It's nearly two hours. It's with surfer shaper Donald Brink. Donald is also a fellow surf nerd and he likes to break down all of the aspects of surfing. This conversation covers a lot of topics. Obviously a little bit of backstory about Donald and is there such a thing as a bad surfboard? We talk about technique, style, we get into some details about boards, wide points, rocker, volume, and overall just a great conversation. Donald is very intelligent and well-spoken, and Donald actually has his own podcast as well called Swell With My Soul, so be sure to check that out. There are links to his show in the show notes, both on your app and on the website. Also, you can get there through his Instagram via my Instagram as well plenty of ways to find Donald and his podcast and of course his surfboards. I thoroughly enjoyed this conversation and learned a lot about surfing. So big thanks to Donald. I mean it's funny you'll see people set up mics and then they leave a big coil at the bottom and you're like well the impede I think it's the impedance value. The capacitance and the impedance is what messes it up. And then also just running next to like 220 currents is not usually good. Well, did you study sound en- engineering? I did, yeah. After you left high school? Yeah. In South Africa? Mm-hmm. How yeah. long was that degree? Uh, it was just a diploma, so yeah, I think it was like a year of study and then practical training. I worked in a recording studio for many years. So yeah, it was, it was really fun. It was it was frustrating because I really enjoyed it. And it, I mean, it was a challenge working live. Um, obviously we were all good friends so the band was really tight and we played a pretty good music but it's um I started to engineer and produce records and with some of Cape Town's best jazz musicians which was amazing but you end up in these positions where you're like getting called on to make calls or decisions in a recording that were important obviously but I was you I was nowhere nearly musically talented like these people which isn't to say you can't call the shots but it was frustrating knowing that I was musically <laughs> only so capable. Knowing, I mean, give me a tool, I'll build something pretty easily, as opposed to fighting through the struggles of how I understand music were different and how naturally it was coming to other people. So I wouldn't say I wasn't in a flow, but I felt like I could flow better in other things. So I do miss it. I really miss playing the drums, but it's been probably, I don't know, I haven't played a drum set in 10 years maybe. So I missed it, but you can't do everything. 
you know. So maybe maybe one day I'll get a kid. <laughs> what, what town did you study in? And that was in Cape Town. In Cape South Town. Africa, yeah. You're from Cape Town. I am. You were born there. No, I was born inland. Moved to the coast to Cape Town when I was 15. When you're 15, is that when you discovered the ocean? Uh, I wanted to surf, so uh, yeah, my dad got a transfer work-wise, and so we had vacation to the beach or the sea, and uh, so dad said we were leaving. I got a wetsuit. Within two days, I had a board. I, I was all set up. I had oh, the really? running. Yeah. What, so you, before you even moved to the coast, you'd oh. already decided? Oh, yeah, I was ready. Had you had a taste of surfing before then, or? No, I, I, I think it was the, I just think it was the sea. There was something about the. I mean, I can remember the first time I saw the ocean. How old were you? I would have been, s- s- the way I remember it, I would have been six. Yeah. I did, you know, I grew up asthmatic. I was really sick as a child, like really sick. And um, at one point, the the doctor said it would be a really good idea to um, start swimming. And uh, they said, if you ever do or can move to the coast, that environment will be best for an asthmatic, asthmatic child. And so that was always in the back of our minds. But um, I was the worst on the swim team. <laughs> But I went and swam all the time and then I'd always go along to the galas and someone wouldn't show up and so I'd be the last guy and they'd throw me in all these races. But <laughs> I wasn't a great swimmer, but it was good for my body because I was so allergic to grasses that to play field sports wasn't a good choice. But yeah, just growing up trying to play sports. I was never a great athlete and it translates to my surfing. Like my technique's terrible. And when I see other people learn stuff or watching somebody else learn to surf, they take on things really quickly and then you realize yeah the guy's like he could play volleyball or you know field hockey within minutes too and so i've always looked at my surfing and technique of what i am and aren't able to do in the water with a lens of being a poor athlete so i work on it probably harder than others to get to whatever level i'm able to but it is frustrating yeah building all these crazy boards but at the end of the day it doesn't matter nothing unless you apply good technique or even just apply any technique which then you can refine so yeah people look at these boards and some people I think expect them to be silver bullets and just answer all the frustrations and they definitely are designed to answer some but at the end of the day it's it's up to you <laughs> yeah the, yeah technique is key yeah you have it's nothing the most important thing yeah 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 well, the, I would argue maybe the board's the most important thing because you can't, it doesn't matter how good your technique is if you don't own a surfboard. I'll challenge that because I agree, but to take it to one next step would be like, well, even if you went body surfing without the mindset, just because you can swim doesn't mean you'll unpack that wave in the best way. Well, yeah, yeah. That's, that's, that's even more fundamental is how you read the way water moves. How you meet it, read everything, yeah, and just the ocean and the, exp- I think the fragility of the experience or the preciousness of it. Or the or its abundance. <laughs> so you were drawn to the ocean, but what? Why surfing? Like, why wasn't it swimming or kayaking or whatever? Why f- surfing? It's a lovely question. It must just must have just been within me because I can't answer that. I do remember the first time I saw surfing, or the first time I can remember seeing surfing on television. It was the Gunston Five Hundred. It was. I'd actually need to look this up to see if it really was what I remembered, but from what I, my memory <laughs> served me, it was about three to four foot onshore. It was at 2.30 on the afternoon. I was surfing Durban, obviously, against the 500. It was a Mondo, Doltro, and Pedersen Rosa. <laughs> Just smashing heats, you know. <laughs> it was, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I, I think I looked at that and said, I'm doing that. I want to do that. Yeah. And then, so that was about... 15 is when you started and then yeah how did surfing progress into making surfboards well in s- well back then in south africa and i'm so encouraged that it's grown and blossomed now what surfing is now compared to what it was in my small world then um it's beautiful to see how it's grown but i lived on a small little cove one cove over from where i went to school so this was all in glenken glenken heights was the beach that i we happened to move to and uh, it was only about three k's across to Fishhook which was the next bigger bay where my high school was and so on and so forth but uh, yeah I just that was the beach in front of our house it's a short walk to the beach and uh, I didn't have a way to get to another beach <laughs> so I had one board and one bad wetsuit and, uh, and a, a daily window to go and play 
So it, uh, yeah, I, just, I literally just surfed that beach for two and a half years before I ever surfed another wave. And I've eventually, there were five other locals and I got to know them all. But at first they were like, who's this kid? Um, but with that, you got to surf other boards at that beach from those guys. And I remember the first day I ever rode a different board. Because <laughs> it sounds probably so rudimentary to say that a surfboard was a surfboard until it wasn't. Because unless you had actually inspected the differences between them, <laughs> or actually felt the difference f of how it even floated. <laughs> but I was always naturally inquisitive of how things were put together or how things work or why they work the way they do. Um, I actually grew up painting as a child and uh, really enjoy art. So, you know, art and creativity and design, design specifically. Yeah, it was when it came to surfboards, it was pretty obvious that I was exploring those things. So I do remember riding a different board for the first time and being like, oh, well, this isn't for me. I was so used to my board, but I was like, wow, that's that's really interesting that it works for him, so to speak. Yeah. Yeah. And how old were you when you shaped your first board? The shaping was the last thing I took on. So I, I, I earned a, sp a spot to watch boards being made. So, you know... There weren't that many shapers around, and so I got to know the right people. And yeah, I just I was just a student of the craft. Every day I'd watch David Ginkle actually from DVG Shapes, very talented shaper. And um, yeah, he, he saw I was interested enough for long enough that he was like invited me into the bay. And every day I'd, I'd design my whole schedule. I'd work in the recording studio all day and knock off by three o'clock. And uh, yeah, I worked hard. I <laughs> woke up at four in the morning, delivered bread. <laughs> I'd have a bread delivery run, be done by 7, go for a swim, start in the recording studio at 8.30 and work till 3. And then I'd have from 3 to 5 and 2 hours every afternoon for, gosh, it's probably a, a year and a half I can remember doing that. So, you know, I, I worked that into my life just to watch how boards were being put together. And um, that led for opportunities to be able to glass boards and do some fins and hot coats and airbrush and those kinds of things. So I'd done everything else, but I... Yeah, it took years before I actually picked up a planner and grabbed the blank. But from then I was start to finish because I knew how to do everything else. So, uh, yeah, and I think I I really should have just grabbed a blank way sooner, thrown in the deep end, but it was such a intimidating task to spend that much money on a precious blank and maybe screw it up. And I wanted to get it right, but I also I didn't, I, I really reverenced the craft of shaping a board and I'm not saying it's different or wrong today, but it just seems a little more accessible, especially where we are. I mean, you can even go and get a second blank. There was no such thing. <laughs> oh, I hadn't heard of a such a thing back home. So, Yeah, the barrier to entry seemed so high. And it was, but um, I think there was a reverence there that I maybe overplayed, but it felt real to me. Mm. Yeah. If a non-surfer asked you, what is the purpose or the function of a surfboard, how would you answer that? The board's there to turn so you can stay fitting into the best part of a curly advancing piece of water. It's simple. Yeah. Well, it, it it's as simple as that because if you understand it that way, you can look at a board and maybe understand its design. You can stand on a wave and perhaps understand your role. And you can definitely walk away with a memory if you apply both those things. So either choosing the right board, fitting into the wave, and creating the best dance or collaboration between what the wave's doing and what it's letting you do and then how you can not even, you can't manipulate the wave, but you can manipulate your movements to then continue and get the best satisfaction out of it. And that's all they are. They, we make these crazy adjustments and changes to the entire craft, which to me is the most important thing is that it is a cohesive design, all the elements working together so that you can fit in the wave and do what you need to do more often with more ease. Yeah. <laughs> so I think you said to me something uh, last time I can't remember the quote but you said you don't sell surfboards <laughs> y yeah I mean I can't remember exactly what I said but I, I don't always see my role as selling surfboards but you're creating tools for people to enjoy the water and if that means m selling a surfboard I mean you're always selling something whether it's yourself or your expertise to an employee for myself, I feel as my role is more of a, um, not maybe a liaison between somebody's ability and their vision f 
through design for what they want to accomplish. And it's important for me to view it that way so that you're not, uh, since it's custom handcrafted art, so to speak, it's a, it needs to be thought of that way so that it's not just widgets or, or a numbers game. Not that other board companies that perhaps approach it that way are wrong. Just for me, I like to view it that way because it also highlights why we're going to the depth with, and I'll be honest, the potential to get it wrong. You know, people trust you with their money to be able to design a rocker that will work. It's really easy to screw it up. <laughs> I mean, it's not rocket science, but it's, it's. I mean, every board you've got to be on your toes and do a good job as a craftsman, but also conceptually be able to envision what they need and then build it well. So that's a risk a customer is taking, and I think it takes that to a less degree of um, how important that risk is or how how much of value it is of the entire experience rather than just the board. So it might be the wrong way to express it, but I like to think of it that way because it helps put the preciousness in what we're really trying to do and the value and how dedicated I am to try and get that right for the for the surfer. I build boards for surfers, not the sea. <laughs> hmm. And there's a quote. Uh, I think it goes that people often people often say there's no such thing as a bad surfboard. Mm-hmm. Only you chose the wrong board for the wrong conditions. Yes. Do you agree Mickey with Minios. that? Yeah, it's Mickey Minos. Yeah. No bad uh, no bad waves, just uh, the wrong equipment. Yeah. I think it's that's how it sums up. Um, I need to answer that carefully. I. Okay. Yeah. There's no bad surfboards, but if if any athlete were left with any surfboard, potentially an inferior one in this conversation, if you landed up with this board, you could learn to ride it. Now, it might require a more athletic <laughs> interpretation of what the board's consistently not wanting to be able to do and then what you're wanting to be able to do to dance with the wave. That's just going to require sm- an incredible amount of skill. So I think there's a disconnect between how much ability you need to unlock a surfboard for what it's built to do and if it's built to do something and it's built poorly and doesn't let you do that often that to me is a difficult surfboard so it might not be bad but those are broad brushstrokes because if you as a designer understand the hydrodynamic principles in a board or express what they should be in terms of a drawing or uh, explanation and then go about your job poorly in crafting that, in my opinion, that's a bad craft, which could be a happy accident and still work well, but you have to hold yourself um, accountable to (laughs) what you're trying to design. So that, to me, would be a bad representation of potentially a good design, or a great representation of potentially a bad design. So you might build the wrong thing very well, or you might have the right idea and do it very poorly. (laughs) So those are bad surfboards because that's not what you were going for, and you can't consistently get lucky or consistently just sort of stumble on magic. Sure, it comes into play, but at the end of the day, as a designer and a craftsman, what do you want to do in the water? Where are your pain points? Where are the frustrating things? And can we understand this thing to great enough detail to manipulate those things and land up with a better result? Mm. Does that make sense? Yeah. It's a difficult job because that vocabulary of what you want to do and also what's the most difficult thing where you're battling with or what are the pain points, to me it's always the easier thing to look at than what do you not want to get rid of. Don't throw away all the good parts in trying to make it better. That's uh, that's the constant, um, <laughs> the constant dance. Yeah, I guess it's all relative too, because you know if Kelly Slater gave you a one of his favorite boards, mm. and you happened to be the same height and weight as him, mm-hmm. it might be the worst surfboard you've ever ridden. It would, but I do think you'd be able to learn how to ride it. It's just that demand would be a long learning curve. Yeah, yeah. But I think the beauty about that hypothetical would if you had a surfboard that a surfboard that had to be ridden right in the pocket right in the power source then it would force you 
to learn good technique because there would be no other way yep. to surf that surfboard. It's the only way to make it go. Hmm. Yeah. And I think that's why people do eventually learn how to surf. Not even learn how to surf well, but at the end of the day, <laughs> once you have a, a sensation of, oh, that that felt good or that worked or I made that section, hopefully you put start putting that little book of tricks together. And the way I've looked at my, both my own surfing and watching other people develop, the way you put that little book of tricks together from one situation to another is battered with style. But you start to, you can see people that surf really well, but they've got no style, but their book of tricks and their sort of reference of things to do and not to do from one board to another is actually very, very vast. And now it's the years of style will start to get better and better and better. How do you describe style? Well, it's the transition between the notes. So if you're doing a turn, a pump, a release, a twist, an air, exit a barrel, enter a barrel, like whatever those highlights are, so to speak, it's the, it, let's call those the notes, it's the gaps between the notes. <laughs> so it's the linking together. I, I try not to look at it as a maneuver and then another maneuver. It's maneuver and then the gap between the next one. That's to me, is generally the biggest dictatorship of what what is style and where it's lacking. Is it present or is there a, a bad... Uh, uh, the seamless transition, I think, is the that seamlessness is is probably the most uh, difficult thing to pinpoint, but also to learn or articulate. Mm. Yeah. Fluidity, flow. Well, that flow is there, but y y y uh, flow between things, yeah. Because we're putting in these little exclamation points. That's why I like to look at them as the notes. You could stand up and be dead still and flow down the line on a longboard. <laughs> which actually would be an, a seamless ride. <laughs> but if you want to carve, cut back, hang heels, trim, back pedal, you know, all those things in a longboard situation, like that's where the style would come in. So either don't do anything, or if you're going to do things, stitch them together in a way that you best should know how. Mm. Team riders and like long-term clients, do you watch them surf? Is it, are you part of their surfing? Yeah, often... Um, Sometimes people will send me a video of themselves surfing. It's pretty rare. Um, one of the best ways to get onto the same page in terms of dialogue is even to to see a video of the waves they're surfing. So sometimes like with an international order, they'll say like, hey, this is my local beach. And um, that's very helpful. To watch somebody surf is even more helpful. You can, I have a way of reading between the lines um, putting together an order form. I challenge people on a fit, few things to get some information out of them, but the way they word things and the way they... It actually, I could pull some out right now and read them, um, what people are articulating they can do, what they can't do, how old they are. I, I like to know how big their feet are, their size, their height, their weight, all those kinds of things. But when last they surfed, <laughs> little things like that. So you can read between the lines, but to... To s to watch somebody surfing is probably the most is probably the most bulletproof way of knowing. I don't like to tell them what to ride, but knowing what they choosing to ride, if what they're looking for is going to fit what they're able to do or want to do. And to me, it's always like, what are you able to do? But what are you wanting to do? And that dis the disconnect between where you're at and where you want to be is it should always be that level of that's where the progress should be happening. You know. And I, I just see a lot of people sell them, sh sell themselves short of what their surfing can be. They're like, well, I'm just gonna settle for whatever, or I'm gonna, I'm just gonna retire to a longboard, which I I love longboarding. I mean, I'm all for it. It's just, just because you're getting older and slower, or a little, you can surf as not as frequently as as you used to. I still don't think there's enough. Um, vision for what you actually want to do in the sea because just because you're older and slow it doesn't mean you don't get to manipulate the wave face on a small round curvy board doesn't make it might not be a short board but now managing a long water line like a long board is it just seems foreign <laughs> It's just as challenging as every any other board really isn't it really it? is to unlock so it's like why are you changing design now Maybe you need more volume or 
so on and so forth. But I just it's it's really rare that you ca- you come across somebody who comes in and says, I I want to do this with my surfing. And it's even more rare to have people come in and show you three boards and be, this is what these boards do for me. This is what I'm not able to do on these. These are the things I want to continue to be able to do. Well, what do people want to do with their surfing? I don't know. There must be some things that you are seeing more often than well, others. Well, you drag it out of them. I mean, there's definitely... Th- but those those are the things... They don't arrive with what they want to do, which is... That's a red flag in and of itself. I mean, are, are they wanting to surf on rail top to bottom in the pocket, like a pro? I think people do want to surf like pros, but they don't know how to unpack what they need to do to get to do that or what they need to be able to do that on. So I think, I mean, it's it's, it's a personal choice. Like Everyone should be wanting to do something quite different. But I think in today's day and age, people want to catch waves easily and need to be able to surf inferior waves well. Because, th- th- I mean, there are so many surfboards in this world we d- we don't necessarily need boards. I'm not saying they're bad boards, but boards that work in good waves are many. But I think the demand for when you're able to surf and where you're able to surf, even if you're a great surfer, it's those in-between days or those in-between good days that make up the bulk of your surfing experience or the daily daily memories you know like when you're able to surf and what you're able to ride or if you're able to beat the crowd and go down the beach and surf worse waves um and that's probably what i've dedicated my small wave gravel performance board spectrum to like just put all the focus in through asymmetry particularly is trying to unpack opportunity for you to have fun in potentially difficult or weak canvases because you know, the water's getting more crowded, but also it's a great way to be able to surf either in less crowds or on your own. <laughs> and even if you go on a great surf trip, you know, those gravel boards are important because they can be the last ones left that are <laughs> they're definitely in the bag in case you get skunked, but, you know, you break all your boards and you still got a chance to rip on something that is still relevant and, you know, tailored towards your, your ability. Hmm. Do you think that that the performance shortboard for the general public is dying? That's an interesting question. I don't think so. I mean... I mean, 10 years ago, were people wanting to potato chips more so than now? Um, I should be able to answer that so quickly. I want to choose my words carefully. I don't... I don't think it's dying because... If you want to surf at such a high level, that's the only board you're going to probably need to be able to... My point is not... <laughs> hardly any people do. But the marketing dictates that. So if, if we're marketing top-down, then those are the boards you will continue to market, and so those are the boards people will want to continue to buy. Um, I, I say right now it is probably down a little bit. My vision for the future is that it's going to be down even more. Not because they're not relevant, but for the amount of people that can unlock them or actually need them. But unless we're showing performance, explosive or progressive surfing on anything else, why should anybody want to aspire to do that? So if you're stuck with X board, you need to see somebody at a higher level showing you how to unlock it. So that's pretty easy when you've got a world champion potentially unlocking a model Obviously, you put your hand up to not be able to surf as well as them, but the aspirational goals are like, works for him, I've got a job to figure that out, and off you go. So you've got every opportunity to um, potentially unlock it to such a degree. <laughs> I think it's up to you at that point. It's not the equipment. But if, if you do start to show a different piece of equipment, you know, once that becomes the norm by other people showing you at, with better ability what those boards can do and how much fun you can have. Once again, it's something to aspire to. Mm, it just seems like, if we, if we use a car analogy, sure. Um, so the pros are the pros are on um, a twin turbo rally car, that's super quick, mm. agile, um, and sensitive. And then average Joe goes out and buys a souped up rally car, and he doesn't know how to 
fine has, doesn't have the fine motor skills to apply the right pressure to the accelerator and just yeah. ends up driving a rally car around a racetrack and at half the speed sure. looks horrible wrecking the engine because it's all over the place <laughs> to me that kind of is when i see average surfers trying to surf performance surfboards and average waves i'm just thinking i mean i used to be like that sure i mean i think we're all were um and and this is a good point to 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 discuss now is but we were still having fun yeah definitely because people look back and they're like i can't believe we used to ride those rocket out skinny thin short boards and it's like the boards did not work they were just very difficult to make work especially in challenging conditions but you're still surfing Sur- surfing it's so fun and i i have had this long conversation with um yeah one of my youngest team riders and He's, I mean, he's just surfing so well now. It's been years. I built him all these shortboards for years and years, and watched him grow. And, and his dad came out of a performance uh, background, so he was a really decent coach and still is. And um, he was saying, you know, that when you start any other sport as a child, the basic objective's really clear. Like you walk onto a soccer field, and you within minutes know we moving this way as a team and putting this ball through that goal. So. That's it. You get better at doing that, but the basic objectives laid out plain. When you go to the beach, you get to be in the water. You maybe stand and write a piece of white water, maybe a green wall of water. It, there's no basic objective of what you're trying to do. It's it's fun from the beginning, and it'll stay fun for the rest of your life, which is so beautiful. But when you start to then get into deep technical discussions of how to surf when to surf what to ride well well those things are they are personal choices but they are it's a real loose it's just a huge can of beautiful worms but to say that it's like we might have been running the wrong boards and probably won't go back to that because of being able to understand the both sides of design and what to ride and what feels good personally but um we were still having a great time <laughs> Well, the question I have around that, I guess, is if someone comes to you and they, and you know they're a, they're a good surfer, mm-hmm. but they're not a pro-level surfer, and they come to you and they want a souped-up rally car, and you th- you were saying to them, eh, you should probably just be in a, a V8. Yeah. It's almost as fast, just a little bigger, a little easier to manage. You don't you don't have to be as um, accurate with your technique, but you're still going to have just as much fun. How do you manage? that like you know this guy you need a little more width you need a little more thickness a little less rocker but you want this i'm like how do you manage that with someone yeah i I obviously i understand my program a little more than than anyone listening but i don't really have that problem because my quote-unquote brand isn't really punching out high performance boards as as much as we i do enjoy building those boards a lot um, so I don't have that as a common problem from a customer. I don't think they're coming to the brand necessarily looking for that. Were uh, that were they ten years ago? Um, Fifteen years ago. Yeah, I mean that's age old. I think the way I've tried to combat that, whether even even if it's a longboard or whatever, or an egg, um, I I do every now and again I take this out of the equation, but for the most part I 100% guarantee my boards. Unless there's shipping involved or something, I'm like, if I'm not trying to convince them, but listening to their story and say, okay, I think I think we should go a little wider or a little bit thicker, or let's stay away from a quad for these reasons. But I'll hand them the board and and it, I've I mean I stand by the product. I'm like I promise you that I've I'm going to build you the most fun board you've ever ridden that works for what you're trying to do. And if if you hate it, bring it back. And they come back. I've, I've, yeah. The stats are low, though. I'm really proud of them. I did, I had two boards come back last year. I built them new boards, um, and it was two the year before. Did you find new owners that loved those boards? Yeah, the one I rode in a contest and made the finals, <laughs> so wasn't a bad board. <laughs> it was, and actually. That's a good story. I'll show you the board. 
it's 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 one of my favorite surfboards actually. It it wasn't a bad board, but the guy came back to me. It was this is a great story and a, let's unpack it. Came in, looked at the website, watched what I've been doing. Lived down the road. He's like, "Hey, I surf all these waves, blah blah blah. This is this is what I'm this is what I'm riding." He showed me about five surfboards that he had. It's like, okay, so I got a grasp of what he was riding, and the boards were actually pretty high performance boards. I was like, "Wow, this guy can surf really good." Okay, um, so I listened to his story. I built him an asymmetrical, but he wanted something for those in between the days, so something a little more softy, grovelly. So I built him this round nose. Pretty complicated board in terms of the rails, the bottom contours, but it was a thruster. And um, imagine a high-performance egg, if there's such a thing. Um, built him the board. And then he sent me a text uh, saying, yeah, I had a couple of serves, still trying to figure it out. I was like, well, give it some time. Um, and he called me. No, he walked in about two weeks later. No. He texts me again. He's like, I want to come and talk to you about the board. I was like, Ab- absolutely. So he walked. I was like, bring the board around. So he walked in. And when he put the board on the rack, I could see he had a traction pad. But the where the wax had been worn, I could tell that his back foot was not over the, over the tail. It was It was straight away. I could tell what was going on. And with the board and the design in question, I was like... The, you will never. Some boards you can stand in the wrong place and unlock unlock to a certain degree and still be having fun. And others, you really got to surf within the design parameters. Otherwise, the thing it's not even going to work. And this was a board like that. <laughs> so I said to him, "I'll build you whatever you want." And he ended up. He's like, "Really?" I was, "Yeah." So I made him a little fish, glass on twin fin. The whole thing it was beautiful, and he loved it. But I said, "I want to ride that board." just for my own interest. But when I saw it and knew it was wrong, and I read the board and yeah, like I said, I ended up surfing it and it's I still have the board, I love the board. That wasn't a bad board, but personally, he wasn't unlocking the design because of poor technique or poor approach, I think. So, it, it, I mean, I think as a brand, you can't do that over and over except for the conversations you have with people, what you're trying to build at the end of the day, it's up, it's up to people. You don't want to tell people what to do. That's not what surfing is. But uh, personally, it's I want anyone to tell me what I'm doing wrong so that I can surf better and have more fun. Yeah. So that was an interesting story, I think. Um, yeah. yeah. How many surfs do you think it takes to, to really judge a surfboard? Whew, that's a beautiful question. Nobody's ever asked me that question. And I think about it often because I'm overly optimistic when you first start shaping. You're like, well, and then I became overly pessimistic in terms of what a board is and isn't doing. And over the years, with 100% honesty, I can generally tell a lot about a board if it's a personal board. So a board I've made for myself within... uh, probably about 20 meters when you when i jump in when i get onto a surfboard i can tell a lot and over the years with that and a confidence of that intuition partnered with um if i forget what i'm riding within a few waves of a session that's a good board and that's i've usually found it's yeah, so that's the first session. I, I always want to give a board the time of day and because we're able to, and I have been working a lot on prototypes of fins and different templates of fins and flex patterns and those kinds of things. Um, it's a board with a set of fins, probably three surfs. And then, yeah, I actually I, I surfed a board last week on the swell that I I actually almost sold the week before and the guy was kind of on the fence and I was like you know what this is he was like oh, I'm just going to get a customer rather I guess get it done right because I, I like the board I was like he's like I was like yeah it was my board but it was I was like yeah it's a little thick you know I liked the way the board felt but it just felt like it was too much board for me and then I wrote it in the swell but I changed the fins and actually wrote it as a twin with the trailer and I'm 
Oh, I was so excited that I didn't get rid of it. So, you know, you 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 can't go through them too quickly. You got to give them time of day. But that's another thing. It's like having too many surfboards can just get in the way too. And I mean, I think you need a quiver of surfboards, but hey man, <laughs> you only ride one at a time. So, and I really think like those boards that I've spent a long time literally unlocking and trying some boards I've one board in particular I can show you and point out there I rode 12 different sets of fins in in about three weeks just spend time on that board just trying to really because for I could understand fins better by staying on one craft mm. so yeah the best surfboard is the surfboard you don't notice uh, that's what I said. Within uh, within three like waves, you, yeah, you you just forget that you are riding a new board or a different board. And the best fins for that board are the fins you don't think about. Exactly, because like I said, the whole thing needs to be working cohesively. Yeah. Yeah, I think a lot of the time people don't give a board enough of a chance. I remember a board I got. And it must have taken me about at least twenty surfs. I got it. And I hated it, but I bought it. I couldn't afford a different board. I just had to ride it. Mm. And I've, I figured it out, and it's my favorite board now. Was that the model you talked about last time? The bunny chow. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. The bunny chow, yeah. But now all your boards before that, I bet the wide points were in different place. Probably. Most most of them are in the middle or slightly forward. Yeah, because that's probably the most nuanced element from what I know of that board is the wide points pretty far back on that board. And it's probably the most, in my opinion, understudied part of surfboard designs and it's it's hard to give people more information but we brought volume to the thing and everyone went crazy on what the volumes of a board is because it was one more piece of information I always get told which is great except for I feel like there's really really big and valuable parts that we can articulate like where a wide point on a model is and if you know where your wide points are for me I stagger them asymmetrically for the way you're standing to help you surf but from model to model, generally it's chalk and cheese. And if you understand which types of boards you enjoy riding, you you don't even have to look at half of a lineup in a brand's itinerary. It can best be okay. I'm I'm best wide point forward. Let's stick to this half, and it it actually can make the whole process easy. So, I mean, that's as much as picking up a straight edge in the garage, and you can do it in the lounge. Do your homework. Like, where's where's the wide point on your board? Go and measure it. It's, it's <laughs> why does it always have to and that's maybe the difference is surfing needs to be rawless and fun and free and the whole thing but if you really want to work on these things it's like you got to take that up on a, you can't just rely on because don't trust the numbers easy you know like I can write whatever volume I want on a board and people I've seen that happen you know but the reason I don't put those dimensions on is because if it feels right it's not a problem but if you want to st like do some do some work yourself you know take it upon yourself yeah yeah why do most boards have the wide point in the middle or forward well the design isn't hold on isn't that kind of relative to how long the board is and w the wide point probably needs to be at a certain place in between your feet or near the, f the heel of the front foot maybe I'm not is it, do you think of it like that? Yeah, I, w I would think of it, and this is obviously, that's why I said which 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 types of boards are working for you. So wide point back doesn't mean it's wrong, just but for certain people, that's what they naturally seem to unlock better when they surf. Um, but do you think, it for, for in my case, do you think it's the it's where the wide point is in com compared to the length of the board, or is it where the wide point is relative to the distance from my back foot? No, it's within length of the board. Is it? So, so a, a, a shorter a board that had the wide point in the middle, but was shorter, and ended up being the same distance from my back foot, it wouldn't give me the same feel as the board that has the wide point back. Uh, I would say no. <laughs> that's a yeah. That's you've broken it down into a graph. I like that. I would say no. Because when you picture that board on rail as it should be in a long drawn bottom turn on the best most committed experience most of that rail line length will be buried right so if that's 5-5 five, five, the, the, the deepest part of that rail being set 
would be where the water is focused and compressed against most. If you draw that curve really, if you extend the curve outlandishly, you can sort of imagine the water hitting that most exaggerated part of the curve and then starting, it'll still hug and hold the water, but starting to release and then go off toward the tail. So if you got a, say a 5.5 five all the way on rail, it's in the middle of the entire craft. So that sensation, because you're trying to control the whole craft, you're not trying to control just a back or front foot. Now it would be much in the same places where it is wide from the tail, but when the board's on rail, as opposed to a 5.8, which all the way on rail, it's going to have a sensation of having a more pivotal reference between your feet, even though it's not. Three inches back is going to feel like you got that fulcrum is probably a nice way to explain where that compression point is, where the board's starting to pivot or ac have an axis of, trans of uh, transition on. It's going to feel like it's almost between your feet. When it's not, it's only three inches back. So I look at the essence of a whole craft, like where the plan shape and the rocker are working together. So an old 70s gun single fin would be seven, eight inches forward at the wide point. But then the nose is pregnant and bulbous and voluminous and then the tail's all pulled in. So where was the point of compression? All the way up there. And then everything behind was control and relief. Long guiding rail, so to speak. But when you looked at the rail shape up there on those old boards, they were full and down because everything was about controlling speed and drawing a line. Yeah. You talk about the board's designed to be on rail. Sure. Most people don't surf on rail. They're still having fun though. <laughs> I wish they would though. I know, but it's, do you still design a surfboard to be on rail even though the person isn't surfing it on rail? You need to, yeah. You have to? Well, no, you don't have to. But if you don't, the sensation you'll walk away from the beach... Well, it, it's like getting a back rub with a jersey on. It's like, what's the p like? Y it's still going to feel fun, but just because they're not doing their job well doesn't mean that the waves aren't going to be moving upwards and shorewards with the curl. And if they happen to do the right thing, that thing's going to come alive. And, I mean, boards get sold to better surfers and on the used market. And no, you design for what the water's doing. I mean, I can make a board that's really easy to surf and and you can surf flat all day long and essentially more, it's probably more of a wake <laughs> wake surfing <laughs> situation. But at the end of the day, those boards won't feel like they're going fast because they won't ever have gone as fast as they could have as opposed to leaning a board on rail and getting rid of that wetted surface minimizing the amount of real estate in the water on a turn as opposed to being flat. So if you do happen to land the board on rail and then go back flat, you should hope to want to keep going back onto the rail situation. Or if you went to a coach for the best situation would be, okay, they'll teach you how to get on rail and the board will come alive. And then you take that to any other surfboard you're riding, which is probably... Oh, I don't even know if I want to go down this. No, let's go down there. That's that's my biggest frustration, not as a surfer, but maybe as a board designer, is the influx of these um, big box retail soft boards <laughs> that you see <laughs> in the water. And it's just a shame that they didn't design a more intelligent rail. And I understand the constraints of how they're assembling that product, but those soft boards are is really... I mean, when last did you really see somebody laying that thing on rail? And there are people that do surf them well, but quote unquote, it's a flat surfing experience. So the nuance of that experience to me is watered down. Like you, wh what was the first surfboard you rode? The first surfboard I rode was a a big eight foot plastic bick. Okay, what was the first surfboard you rode a green water open face wave on? Um, I had a 6.4 local motion. What color was it? <laughs> um, off yellow. <laughs> like Perfect. Like <laughs> so think about that sensation. It's, lo it's, it's, it's within you. Now look at a generation of kids or people being exposed to surfing right now. That sensation of your first open face ride, is it's, it's part of your surfing fabric. And the rail shape, 
and the ability of that board to be locked in on a rail is I'm not saying it's impossible to happen but it's it's pretty much defined into the accuracy of what it potentially could even on the best ride that kind of rail shape with that kind of bottom contour and those kinds of fins quote unquote broad br broad brush strokes here like the sensation in that design is it's not wrong because it's still fun but when you go back and I go back to my first surfboard experiences the sensations of having a board flowing through green or blue water for the first time out of the white water that's was a good rail coming to life and that those sensations you just explained them right now without hesitation have you ever had a client ask you I want a board that's going to force me to surf on rail in the pocket yes yeah and it usually comes after building them a few boards actually yeah another good story I've got a really good friend I've probably built him more boards than he's probably my longest standing customer and um He's a big guy. He's 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 two hundred pounds, but he's he's just he's tall and he's he's strong. Um, yeah, Tom. Shout out to Tom. And hi, he, Tom. Yeah, hi, Tom. He came in and um, I'd built him a couple of the boards and I'd let him try some other stuff because he's on the bigger end of the spectrum and it's re he's really a valuable friend to have because I can give him something that's that part of a demographic, you know, like hey, is this how does this feel? how does this board with these fins feel? Because it gives me confidence in when I'm guiding somebody on the other side of the coast that I'm shipping a board to. So um, I'd given him some boards to try and he came back and he um, he wanted uh, he wanted a new board and uh, he had sold one or two others or something and he's like, what are you thinking? I kind of like that board you had posted or a picture of something. I was like, no, no, that's it's still in development stages. It's definitely a personal testing board, but... Um, he's like, yeah, I was thinking something like that. I was like, no, that's that's too far off. I'm I'm wasting your time. I'll work on that design myself, you know. Um, but I showed him a couple of boards, and I was like, you know what? You need to you need to challenge yourself to surf more performance board. And I'm not telling you to get a short board, but I think you need know, you need to get rid of all the volume as an exercise. And I showed him that board right there the one you're seeing that I just repaired it was um th that's a magical surfboard and it's a team rider board and I showed him that board and I was like look obviously this is too small but the concept of this board is the whole premise of the board is to be it's a fuller nose it's only 14 and a quarter inches wide the nose um it's 19 and a half inches wide and yet the deck is flat so that board's one and just under two inches it's it's call it two inches wide two inches thick but it carries it all the way to the rail and then the rail's really down and th that board the concept of that board was to have a small wave low rocker groveling still performance board yet with the flat deck your interpretation of what you are doing on the wave and the feedback, I like to say, the feedback from the wave with those down-focused rails would be able to give you an interpretation of what you're supposed to be doing and what you are doing. So I was like, let's build you a board like that so that you can have a more performance sensation, but the sensation is going to be what you're going to fall in love with. And I said to him, I was like, you, you're biting off quite a bit here. You know, like, are you willing to sign up to have a board that doesn't paddle as well? And and we built the board at six feet. I think I went out to nineteen and seven eighths, so not crazy. Within this, the you know the ratios were still on point, and it was maybe two and an eighth, so not crazy thick. And um, yeah, the feedback was really good. He said his first surf, he battled a little bit. He surfed, he got a few waves, and then the tide went too high and was really hard. So he kind of wrote that one off. And he said, the next three or four surfs, he forgot that he was lacking the volume. So it took a surf, and then he was back on, back on the horse. And, yeah, enjoyed that board greatly till he got an ear infection and missed that last swell. But I can't wait to actually touch base with him later today and maybe tomorrow and see um, how it's feeling since he's been back in the water. So that became a daily driver. 
great exercise. I've been doing the same thing too, just building really more high performance boards for one to understand it more to make changes for some of the projects I'm working on. But yeah, it's important, man. You don't always have to make things easier for yourself. But a hi- but a high performance surfboard doesn't have to be a souped up rally car, does it? Um, it can be a V8. Yeah, I think at the end of the day, in terms of surfboards in this conversation, I think once you've got a pulled in nose and a tight down rail with a skinny profile, it's high performance just because of the way it does and doesn't float. Because <laughs> you have to enter the wave with agility and the right, you you, can't, you don't even get a chance to unlock the design with that, with poor or inferior technique. You don't even get a chance to play nettle and turn and bob and weave. So that to me is where I draw the line and what is high performance and what's not. Because I can make you know, a 6-4 egg that's a really high performance surfboard. It's going to be easy to catch waves, but are you able to perform at a high degree through that design? Yes. As opposed to a high performance board that where well, you can't even get into the wave net alone articulate a good performance on it. So I, st- I actually think all boards are performance boards <laughs> it's just what are you trying to perform that makes sense it, it's it sounds kind of intuitive but i think it does make sense i look at any board and i think it's like a real watered down performance board or a high performance within that genre yeah i guess you could almost think of it to use music as an analogy mm. you could think of fast jazz as performance Right, but then you could also think of something really simple, like a slow classical guitar, mm. simple song. Someone can still perform that song. It's just they're getting something different out of it. So if someone's on a big fat fish and they're not on rail, they're just cruising down the line. Yeah. But they're doing it with flow and style and grace, and great, they're in tune with the wave. It's still a performance. Yeah. It's just not maybe competition. Technical competition performance maybe maybe um, technical is the right word it's a really technical surfboard because you need yeah, that's a great word because you need good technique to even unlock it and some boards are they're less technical but you can still unlock them so it's back into the surface the ball's back in their court I think a lot of people benefit from riding high volume surfboards so long as you're trying to ride them the right way and then when you go back and give yourself less volume, you feel like you're incredibly in control and the thing's so nimble and agile. So it's good to go both ways, but that's that's a recipe for disaster unless you're trying to train. Yeah, it's interesting. Because I know, I know a, a pro surfer surfs really well. He rides, it's about my size, rides about one liter less than what I like to ride. Which is? I like about a 28 litre board for for good waves, mm-hmm. um, and he's on a 27 litre. But then I know another pro who's the same height and weight as me, and he rides 32 litres mm-hmm. on his high performance boards, which is it's, so it's it is definitely relevant. He I think maybe he's just stronger and has better technique. I think it's harder when the waves are good to to get a a higher volume rail in you to judge. the water when you're going fast. Yeah, I. Th- I I look at that and say I design around the pain points. So if he came in and said, look, well, I want this board and the first thing you need to look at or ask or address or make sure you understood, personally I feel like, okay, let's say I make this board for you and I do this often and say, okay, whatever, it's in question, it's a, a groveling board or high-performance thruster, whatever it is, I say, let's say we assume we get all the dynamics right and all the elements work together and we've done what you asked me to do what's the one thing that's going to frustrate you most if you got this board? So we've checked all the boxes. Here's your board, you go surf it. What's the first thing that if it does, you'll be frustrated with? So for him, he would probably have said, I just hate the feeling of not having enough board under me and that lack of volume. So as a designer, then I can embrace volume and maybe tweak other things so that he can have control, but make sure that just don't not giving enough volume, which is hard to do. But for his sensation, and I, I would say I'm the same way. I love a high volume board, and it is hard to surf high volume boards on rail, especially in tricky situations or on long, powerful calves sometimes. But you can pull the rails down, but that's also starting to get into a risky territory design-wise. But 
that sensation it comes from my muscle memory like i grew up riding that board for three years was a flat deck down railed safari spider thruster a six two i think it was I, I rode plus volume forever that i just feel at home on that he'd probably get used to 28 his surfing might even get better but would he lose the joy well, he's a very powerful surfer though so, so he might we, need that extra yeah See, that's the thing too. It's like you've got to chase what's working, what you want to do, but then don't kill the joy getting there. Hmm. Yeah. Do do you... What do you think about volume as a way to talk about surfing? Yeah, well, Surfboards. I mean, volume is really irrelevant unless it's within reference to something else. Because if you could say 28 liters, I could hand you a ball. So good luck catching a wave on this. So... 28 litres with extreme rocker clearly won't paddle as well as 28 litres within a fish. So I like I like the consistent variable when you're referencing a file or making a change, and this would be for an incredibly high athlete that can feel the subtle subtleties from one board to another. I think it's a really nice um, variable and dimension there. I think it's a fascinating statistic. I feel... I feel like it steers people in the wrong direction. Though. Yeah, but is it only is volume only relevant for um, machine-made boards? I because you can't. I consider volume. I do not calculate it. Yeah, Cause I you can't, can't, right? I would love to have a sink tank or a chamber, and I think that would be a fascinating um, trade show booth. Bring your board. Let's see what it really is. I said it the other day, and it was it was totally off. Off, uh, off the cuff, but yeah, maybe a little out there. But I was like, you want to add volume to your board? Put a big traction pad on the thing. It floats. Like, <laughs> it's just. Are you looking for volume to catch waves or have freedom in a big or diverse lineup, or are you like your friend is battling to? He's oversinking the rails. So, when people come to see you for a board, are they hung up on volume too much? Oh, it's definitely part of the conversation now, yeah. Um, and they'll quote volumes of their latest 10 boards or whatever it is. And it's great. It's a good reference to read through the lines. I I still think the best way to come back to, okay, what do you want to do in the sea is what I'm trying to get out of them. So that vision element comes back and it's like, what's the most frustrating thing going to be? So if volume comes up too much or there seems to be a uh, discommunication between what they've quoted or what they've said when I ask them about frustrations it's going to be not having a board that feels too big or battling to catch waves so then you can kind of steer yourself in a certain direction and that's probably just an honest conversation for anyone to answer f within their own surfing it's like am I battling to catch waves or am I battling to apply technique to actually control this thing hmm. do you consider surface area was all about surface area and that's within relation to the plan shape and the rocker so I look at wetted surface area so it's pretty easy to make a big surface but I'm envisioning what that surface through the bottom contour and the rail shape is going to be steered as so that's when it comes to bottom contour and fin positioning and angle but surface area yes but when you're trying to manage it so I'll give you as much as you can so that the feeling of making your way around the water is easy but then once again it comes back to when you're on rail or when you're supposed to be and it's it, that that conversation gets better expressed when you do say that pink board up there i hate to design that i've made them up to seven two but i that that board past six foot nine and a half which is just the magic numbers over the years i've landed on it becomes a different craft because you can't duck dive it well you can but you've got to have really good technique or if you're in powerful surf, that's a lot of board to get pushed around underwater. At which point, now you you may as well be on eight five. Like so, it's designed to be ridden at a waterline length, and then I control the volume with spooning out the deck. But saying that, like volume is now considered incredibly. So I'm giving you as much volume as I can, but only up until the play point where your experience isn't hindered by it. If you can't duck dive, well, good luck. Well, that's a good point. Yeah, it's a really up. good point because it'd be the first thing that's frustrating for a guy coming in ordering a mid-length. I'm like, 
do you want to duck dive this board? And he's like, absolutely. And if you don't, it's like, okay, well, now we've got, we got some options to choose from. Yeah, or even if you had one of your, uh, if you had a, a, a big, big, fat, thick twin fin that went really well in good waves, but then all of a sudden you get a swell that's just pulsing and you can't even duck dive the thing. You chose the wrong board. It might work really well on the wave face, but if you can't get back out the back, then, yeah. So, so that, once again, like I say, look at your surfing and see if you can let, write them down. Chart, see if you can chart out where your pain points, where your, where your areas of frustration. And you'll very quickly start to see what you need to start focusing on other technique-wise or board-wise. It's like, okay, what do you want to do? Where, where, What's getting in the way here? I feel like most people's techniques, my technique certainly gets in the way before my equipment. Um, and that was one of the questions I had in the boardroom show. Um, that survey that you saw saw me compiling was um do you feel like your equipment or your ability holds you back as a surfer in your surfing experience and across the board it was people's um, ability so and that's the thing is you know with the ability to replicate designs and models f within these machine um, brands it's uh there's a lot of really good surfboards out there so it's it's about figuring out which one works for you and then unlocking it you mentioned foot size before. Mm. Does the foot length determine, somewhat determine the the width that you should be riding? I, I don't shape differently according to your foot size, for the most part. I mean, boards are naturally bigger than your feet, but it's an interesting look. You're driving the entire craft, starting at your feet into your knees, waist, hips, hold it. You know, it's your whole body, but your leverage ability with bigger feet is of huge value so if you are and I've, I mean some of even team riders over the years they, I mean obviously they surf really well and they have small feet I'm not saying they're not they can't surf well but that's just a harder task for them without as much leverage and often you'll see somebody you'll come in at whatever their height width and weight range is oh wait they got really small feet so straight away their ability to unlock no matter what you design is going to be essentially powered <laughs> with uh, <laughs> less less of an accuracy. It, that would be a really interesting study is to see who's who's on tour and or like the average foot size on tour. There must be some sort of a algorithm to be able to hide with all that stuff. But well, it would also matter. I mean, uh, some people surf with their foot at 45, some people at 25 degrees, that front foot. So that determines how long your foot is mm -hmm. on either side of the stringer at the angle you have it too yeah yeah w was it you in one of the podcasts recently talking about having the toes slightly forward to avoid injury I think it was um, Clayton yeah oh gosh I can't wait to meet that guy one day I, I really respect his ability to explain what surfing is and also uh, clearly his vision for board design and how it's supposed to be used and what it's used for yeah yeah, I respect him as a. I've never met him. Yeah, but always see his boards coming through Cape Town from Durban years ago. A couple of the guys used to ride the Claytons, and they were always white, white, white with the red and black logo. They were, oh, they looked so good. <laughs> yeah. There's a on the there's a South Africa there's a there's a word you South Africans use. <laughs> there's many of them, mate. <laughs> Tr transition. Transition. <laughs> Is that even a word? It's transition. <laughs> <laughs> Rosie Hodge says it all the time. Transition. Yeah. It, do you Quite mean specific. transi transition? Sure. Is it? Is it just a, like a South African slang? Uh, we don't even notice it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Rosie's the best man. She yeah. she is one of probably the most consistent surfers I have ever. I made her a couple of boards actually, but. I mean, surfed with her a bunch, and day in and day out, she's never doing the wrong thing. She's a great surfer, but she's very consistent, and it's probably why she did so well on the tour. But yeah, man, I've seen her ride all kinds of boards too, and she's just out there doing the right thing in the right time. And yeah, I think that's always a biggest value to any surfer is a consistency in your surfing. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, that's what makes the pros so good they're so consistent yeah I, I I wonder how much of that's a mental fortitude and unpacking what to do or if it's 
the way you've trained or if that's something then you you get good at surfing and then you become more consistent or you're consistently get it, getting good at surfing and then maintaining consistency in whatever level you're at because I'm confused on that mm, or they surf so much that's a lot to do with it too I think yeah maybe but but for Rosie for instance in this conversation like when you see her riding an oddball board at the beach like hey, hey ride this thing or you see her riding something she rides within the design so now all of a sudden, yeah, she's surfing a lot, but now you've changed the craft and she's still consistently relevant. That to me is a good indicator of a surfer is if you're surfing within the design of any board. Well, I guess what's consistent with good surfers is they read the wave, they yeah. read the water so well. Yeah. So if they have an intuitive feel for how the where that board needs to be and yeah. they're reading the water well, then they pick the right line. Or they pick any line they want, essentially. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you got a few a few more on offer, but yeah, yeah. Hmm. yeah, that's very true. But no, you're right. I mean, yeah, Clayton, the way Clayton breaks down, that he he changed my perspective on how to surf a board on rail the most out of any coach I've worked with. Yeah, yeah, I'd encourage people to go back and listen to those two yeah two episodes you've got with him. I think it's um, man, I uh, I've referenced the that um information pretty often especially I met Clayton about two years ago or first interviewed him and my whole surfing before that I was always looking at the down the line or at the top of the wave and what are you doing now? looking on the bottom yeah. where's the power zone at the bottom I want a bottom turn yeah the, the way that the, the connecting the dots of the power zone was nicely said yeah and yeah. it took me it was only about uh, six weeks ago when I first did a proper bottom turn. So it took me two years of trying to get a proper bottom turn. I don't is that think on, that on that trip you did? Yeah, I don't think people realize how hard it is to change a bad habit. Oh. And how how demanding it is. To, if you can get a surfboard on, out on 45 degrees and all your weight on the front foot ready to spring off, that, is, that you've got to be strong. You've got to have good alignment. Yes. It's not easy. It takes a lot of focus to change the average shallow, not on rail bottom turn into a proper bottom turn. And in the first one I did, I f was flying to the top of the wave with more. Sp I didn't know I couldn't do a top turn. I was going way too fast. I was like, I'm going to break my leg if I try and change direction. It was phenomenal. That was on your front side. Yes. That growth and. Um technique now that are you able to translate that onto your backside with with that not muscle memory but that sort of understanding now of what that sensation is i've always found it easier to do a bottom turn on my backside uh-huh yeah so why is your board the same on both sides good question that's all i'm saying is like for me the asymmetry i'm not trying to reinvent the wheel i just looked at the common frustrations or the ability to leverage and reference oneself on a wave face and your muscles and your body infrastructure is just it's just different, you know. Yeah, for sure. It makes complete sense, yeah. Yeah. I, I Yeah, that man, that whole bottom turn thing, it's so d I wanna ask you though, is so you you Clayton explains that you go out there, it takes two years, you get to your first one. Do you remember it now because you've done one or are you just constantly trying to refine what you put into that well, one? I, I I actually put I had to put two pieces together before I got it. So Clayton gave me the intellectual piece. This yeah. is this is what you need to do. This is what you need to focus on. This is how you do it. You you don't twist. You lean into it. Yes. Get that board on rail, 45 degrees. If When your board's at 45 degrees to the water, that gives you, it's the same as jumping off a flat surface. You've yeah. got, as, you can push as hard as you want to jump. And then one of the other re more recent interviews I did, well, I did two in a row. I did I interviewed um, Taylor Knox and yeah, then Matt Griggs. That. Yeah, enjoyed that. And you've, <laughs> if you don't focus 100% on changing that one thing, and you've got to focus on one thing. Exactly. So you go, you go out there, you don't even, the only way I managed to do my, that first bottom turn was just, okay, I don't care about a top turn. Yes. All I want to do is get into the wave in the right place, drop down straight, get it on rail, get the bottom turn. And as soon as I was so single-mindedly focused on that one thing, that's the only way I got to do it. And I also combined that with 
another thing that um, that Matt Gregg said was that y you've got to get in touch with the feeling first. So I spent a lot of time in the gym in front of the mirror trying to, I basically had a picture of Julian Wilson, <laughs> his bottom turn, and I wanted to f my body to fit. How do I get my body to look like that? What does that feel like? And what I started to realize is it feels like you get this, how do we describe it to listeners without visual? You, you feel, so on your front foot, you feel your glutes and your hamstrings yes. are loaded. Okay. Complete, they're fully stretched. So that you're ready to, to spring. Got it. If you're down like so in, a, in a squat position, no. Nah, you need to be in that lunge, leaning forward, pushing your butt back. Yeah. It's obvious when you look at Julian Wilson's bottom turn that there is all of the tension through his posterior chain on that front leg is just, he's just, he's just, that, those, all those that muscles and the, the hamstring glutes is just ready to spring out. And you can get in touch with that feeling in the gym. And then when you focus, you go, I, all I want, I'm going to drop down, straighten the wave, fast as I can, using gravity, get the board on rail, and I'm going to mimic, how does my leg feel? And can I lean that elbow towards my front foot and l to try and touch the water? And combine that with the feeling of the front foot, with the front leg, and focusing on that one thing, then it clicked. So all of those elements came together and I finally got that bottom turn. And I did it, I think got three good waves and did three good bottom turns that day. I was lucky enough to be being filmed at the time, so I got visual proof of it. Sure. And um, my hamstrings and glutes were so sore the next day. Yeah, I bet they were, yeah. They were like, wow. I felt like I'd, I'd done three sets of one rep max squats in sure. the gym. I was like, oh man. I didn't realize how hard, how much force that goes through your body mm -hmm. to do that. So, yeah, I think it's so fascinating. It's uh, <laughs> it's night and day. the f The feeling of a of a bottom turn that most people do compared to the feeling of a proper bottom turn, it's, it's night and day. And the amount of drive and speed you're flying up to the lip is it's almost scary. Like, mm. yeah. I mean, if you if you look at how much energy we the a wave has, even a crumbly wave, like if you've ever been on a a boat that's in the wrong place and you're going to get hit by white water or been hit by white, I've got a good story about that. Yeah. Okay, there you go. <laughs> like you you realize how, and when you're out surfing, it's these waves are sometimes even more powerful and they're barreling or maybe could be barreling. The amount of energy around you, clearly on offer, if you can tap into it. I think I'm watching you demonstrate that and I've listened to those bits of information that you um, gleaned. I feel like the biggest disconnect is your position of your back because most guys are saying keep your back more straight. I think if you don't come in with the orientation of your spine and the alignment of where you're trying to be because the thing of getting low and touching the water is great except for don't do it when you're leaning over. So your quickest way there is to lean it. Yeah, your quickest uh, way is to lean, but then you bend your back. But you got to. You have you have to practice glutes. in the mirror. Yeah, en engaging the glutes gets your your spine in the right position because now your spring can recoil, huh? Yeah. Yeah, it looks like a real real surf photo. We're looking at the before and after here of you. Yeah, I'll, I mean, I'll post. I'll put it up on Instagram when we release this podcast so people can get the visual on it. But that was that took me. Uh, that was the first day I arrived. Yes. And that was the at the end of the week. You just did one. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> three, only three. <laughs> As on the last day, it finally clicked. I got the bottom turns. So when you, I mean, this is, yeah, that's incredible. So when you surf, I know you've got a fascination for how to unpack small waves, and I do too. So when you surf on a small wave now, are you frustrated or do you get a percentage of that sensation on a small wave? I'm trying to now, because the wave was solid and fast and powerful, yes. it was in the tropics, now coming back to California and trying to get that same technique on a small wave, yeah, that that's the next challenge. Yeah, I haven't. It's it's hard. That's what Tommy Carroll. That's what Tommy Carroll unlocked. And then I feel like once you can do that, then now you're surfing. The boards don't matter. Nothing. It doesn't matter anymore. And you're now you're playing with the ocean. Hmm. Yeah. This is the you, you got to you have to read the bottom of the wave. Yeah. And you have to read it to a very, a, in a detailed way. You have to mm. be very focused. 
I mean, look at Tom Curran. Where does he look when he's dropping? And he's not looking at the lip. Mm. He's looking like a foot in front of his board all the time. Yeah. And I think when is when you learn to read the bottom of the wave, you, who's someone? This is not my thing. Someone else said this. A good surfer. When you learn to read the bottom of the wave properly, you then start to know what the top of the wave is doing based on the information the bottom of the wave is giving you. What's well, about to be the top of the wave, sir? So yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So you, it's like Clayton, uh, his way of talking about it is like you dig the rail into that part of the water, and because the water's drawing up to the top, you that rail sticks, and you get a free ride up, yes. up to the top. Oh, I see. What you, okay. That makes more sense now, yeah, because the round... But if you drop down and you put all the pressure on your back foot, you get a change of direction up to the top, but you lose all your speed. And you hit the top you and you lose, your, the wave, yeah. you lose the speed and then you drop down again. And that's most people's surfing, right? It's top to bottom sometimes, but it's very staggered. There's no flow. I mean, I think if you're battling to picture this, listening to it, just think about it for long enough and you'll make up your own picture in your mind. But that's the thing is just... That's like any of the board designs. Just sit here and think about it for long enough. Draw a picture of a board or a rail or of a bottom turn and top turn. It's not that difficult, but we just, oh, personally, I feel like often you don't take enough time to break it down and then figure out what's the next piece to work on. Yeah, well, I mean, as you slow down any pro surfer surfing waves, you'll, you'll realize and then you try and mimic their body positions at on a bottom turn you realize, oh, I don't do that when I surf. <laughs> I'm not that low. My elbow, my forearm isn't touching the water almost. Yeah. I'm not fully compressed into my into my knee and my hip with a straight back, et cetera, et cetera. I feel like the future of surfing, though, is really in technique. It's not necessarily in design. I think designs that let you do things you'd never be able to have been, to to do on anything else is really progressive, and I'm dead set and trying to be able to be part of that but i'm excited to watch you start to articulate how to i like those two points you listen to i like how you put them together i like how you've done the muscle memory i'll tell you now what i'm working on but how to explain how to do that or make give a faster track to um being able to do this in small waves is the future of surfing because i look at these wave pools i look at like I said, once again, crowded situations, you end up surfing inferior waves. Once the best surfing is happening when you're able just to look at that whatever wave size and be able to unlock it. Like I think that small wave situation in terms of, of unpacking what to do there is the most valuable thing right now in surfing. Yeah. yeah. I mean, look at golf. You've got the driving range. Tennis, you've got the ball machine and a coach. Well, generally the beach we've always got something small to play on so that's why i look at it as a golf driving range it's like at least if you can learn to, it's the hardest canvas yeah it's a driving range in the wind and the rain <laughs> so you can still hit the ball but you got to be better it's almost like it's it's like the driving range but you're underwater yeah something's changed it's, like it's, it's against you but you still you got a chance to play yeah but now the wave pools are going to offer that precious not yet but soon yeah. the preciousness of a wave I think that's what has held me back in my surfing most is no matter what stage I'm in, I'm having fun. So that's great and a beautiful part of surfing. But when it comes to technically um, unlocking how to surf better or how to unlock a design, it's the preciousness of waves. It's just willi being willing to waste waves is the, it's the hardest thing because there's such a... Uh, and it's so funny, like, I'll go out there and do those Barton Lynch drills and, like, literally just surf the as many waves as you can and just, you know, get the reps up and just... And even so, it's like, you're still precious with them. <laughs> I don't know if it's because like I love it too much or what what gets in the way, but I think that's I think that's probably the biggest barrier to progression is just being willing to go out there and work on one thing at a time until you master it. Yeah, it's also the willingness to to go too far as well. So, that. so most most people know what it's like to do to try and do a bottom turn um, too far out in the flats. Oh right. 
and bog rail and lose all the speed. Everyone knows what that feels like, right? Sure. Everyone knows what it feels like to 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 drive out away from the power of the wave and bog rail trying to come back. Yeah. Right. But do you know what it's like to fade too far into a bottom turn and just get eaten by the whitewash and get the board on at 50 degree? You lean over too far, too far back, and you're going through a bottom turn and you look up and you don't see any wave face. It's all white water. You're too far back. When's the last time you did that? Yeah, you went too far into the learning curve. Uh, yeah. Now you think of how Kelly Slatter used to surf in the 90s, like almost way behind, way just almost surfing in the white water. He wasn't even... Do you know, remember that stage when yeah. he was just like, doing foam climbs and surfing super deep? That's why I look back on that era, and I'm glad we're not in that right now. But people belittle those boards somewhat, but a narrow surfboard will let you be on 45 way quicker. And you give any good surfer a board, and they're like, oh, it just feels too wide. And it's like, well, it's the first thing they did when they stood up on the board was go into a bottom turn like that and realized how you weren't able to get onto that 45 so it's uh yeah especially if you've got small feet <laughs> well he doesn't <laughs> but <laughs> yeah um yeah i was having co- a conversation with kalohe and dino down at the beach the other day and we were talking about feet sizes and so on and so forth because i was holding this asymmetrical board and we we're talking about and i said to him i was like well you you must have boards you like on your backside versus front side and he's actually really articulate with what's in his boards which i really appreciate and him and Matt have obviously worked on those boards it's so much. And he's like, yeah, I can really, I like my, f- I, I'm, and I'm trying to remember exactly what he said, so I'm not quoting out of turn, but he said that he liked his flatter, straighter boards on his backside because he can push on them for so much longer, which would be then a great choice to put on his backhand part of his quiver. <laughs> but if he knows he's surfing a backhand wave, he might be gravitating to that part of his array of boards. So it's interesting, but then he's like, oh, yeah, and I've got, like, I think he said an 11 and a half or 12, and he's like, yeah, and my feet are flat. <laughs> so he was really in tune with what he had to offer and, and what he was working with, you know. Hmm. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, I, I feel the same way, actually. I pref- I'd prefer to ride my flyer backhand, but bunny chow forehand. Well, let's mix those up. Yeah. Yeah, why wouldn't you? <laughs> you see, that's, that's all it is. It's like a, my job, then I look at it as like, I, I'm not trying to reinvent the wheel or belittle any parts of a flavor of a board. So like those boards have the meat and potatoes are the kinds of obviously bottom contour, plan shape, wi- but wide point, what is the wide, po- like where's the wide point? Like it's generically basically short boards. So pointy nose, pulled in, they've got a curve, they come into a relatively pulled in tail blocks. Um, so that's the flavor but then the n- the nuanced details would be where are those wide points and then which parts are working best in terms of serving the way you're trying to unlock a wave. And that's most obviously set by which way you're standing. So they weren't bad boards, but you were able to tap into certain parts more readily on one and not on the other. Yeah, it's fascinating, the surfboard. It, yeah, it's so simple. <laughs> yes, it's yeah, it's riddled. Simple for it. you. <laughs> but, but, it, but when you look at most other designs i mean <laughs> it's we're not going that fast and it's not most of them work fairly well <laughs> i mean there's a world of details but they are pretty simple but just getting those simple things right is is such a task yeah it's 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 funny when i've been working on my surfing and it's i think it's classic like anything you're trying to do you get to um focused on one area and then forget all the other things that you had either gotten right or f- had worked hard to to um, include. And um, yeah, I've really been trying to work on more like one line surfing. So it's just no double pump of the bottom turn, just one bottom turn. And it's all good and well, except for when the waves aren't great. It's really hard to do that. So with that in mind, Whichever, whichever waves I'm surfing, I'm working on the same thing so that I'm learning it across a whole spectrum or a variety of waves. But what happened was, and I went for a surf one uh, a couple of days ago with my t- with team rider Ian, and he's got such great technique and he's very consistent too, you know, and so I always i am getting two cents from him every time because I've asked for it. I'm like, hey, where am I going wrong here? Because I want to learn. And um, we walked away from the surf and I was like, man... 
I've been working so hard on like single power maneuvers, like single drawn lines, but I feel like I'm surfing so heavy all of a sudden. So I'd lost that liveliness because I don't generally surf heavy footed. Like I'm fairly hot doggy and lively, but trying to work on those single maneuvers, I'd flattened everything <laughs> out so much. So now I've got this, but it was great because I realized that I was like, yeah, because I, I, when I got it right, it felt great, but that liveliness in between was lost, and so now I've got to backpedal a little bit and figure out. I feel like I'm missing one piece in between. <laughs> the flow. No, I was trying to flow too much, I think. Huh. I lost the flow. Yeah, you, uh, there you go, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, You're being so intentional to just be trying to flowing from one maneuver to another, but yeah. Overthinking. I I still don't know if it's overthinking or thinking too much about just one thing, you know. So too focused instead of a broader view, you know. Yeah, overthinking one element maybe. Yeah. Uh, mm. Yeah. Yeah. So you've entered the podcast world. I have. Welcome. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I feel <laughs> I feel like fully ill-equipped and um, under <laughs> under um, under-equipped, should I say? Yeah. No, it, it's it's good. It's um, I'm excited about just sharing. I have these conversations about technique and rails and rocker and fins daily, and to maybe capture some of them and share with people. And I'm s I'm I'm appreciative of what I've learned, say, from your podcast in particular about trying to literally just hear somebody's perspective. Which it's amazing the things I've gleaned from those certain episodes that might have. I've fallen on deaf ears to somebody else, but for me at that moment it meant something and I look at the podcast thing as fairly evergreen material, you know. The way we're going to be unlocking waves is not going to be much different, even if the boards change in 20 years. So it's yeah. to add to that conversation of what surfing is. and yeah. yeah, it's timeless. It really is. Yeah, if you want to learn more about surfing, the information is always going to be timeless. Yeah. It's good, so of course, it's going to evolve and boards are going to involve but the ocean's just going to keep doing its thing and mm. we're going to keep going in there and trying to play with it yeah yeah do you look at your relationship with surfing as playing or is it uh, a combination of that and a physical exercise I mean, how so it's always different it is yep I think it's different every time what's I think what's consistent though is you're getting outside yourself you're getting in into mother nature um, sometimes you can go out there on a long board and sit out there with the salty dogs and riff about something and catch the odd wave or you could take a, a performance board and sit on the inside and try and just hunt wedges and just try and catch I want to catch 10 waves in half an hour and just just go for it and then out the back there's the other guy sitting out there chatting and catching the odd set wave yeah so it's it's what you get out of it, what you want. And it depends on your mood. But that comes back to our conversation. What do you want to get out of it? And I think for me, I'm maybe I'm just too much in my head because I'm literally dealing with this all day and I love it. Like I, I love what I get to do. But I look at people that come in this door and it's like, like you want to shake them and be like, well, what do you actually want out of your surfing? You clearly are having these conversations in your head, but I, I just don't know that everyone is. And it, to be honest, it's like, well, here's your board, but I really can't help you. I mean, that's that's an honest response, I think, which I, I, I don't, I'm not judging them at all. I just, yeah, it's intentionality. I mean, it's from anything. That's why I don't think surfing's any different to anything else in life. It's all the same stuff, you know. It's connection. It really is. I think that that's how I would summarize it, is I want to connect mm. with the wave. Sometimes I want to connect with, the salty dog out the back who's mm. bitching about something it's hilarious yeah. you know but it's always a connect. I mean with the ocean it's a connection with the ocean I think that's that's all that's the consistent whether you're out there hunting wedges or whether you're out there just chilling and catching a, and gliding on a few runners you're still searching to connect with that wave to connect with the ocean to immerse yourself in water that's always consistent mm. and it's always it's always there too like sometimes the waves are just uh, I probably should do something else but I force myself 
to go surfing. I was like, no, I'm just gonna just gonna go and go out there for ten minutes, catch three waves, mm. and that's the best. Like, I've never ever regretted that. Yeah, I never regretted going for a surf. I've I've gone mm, not today and driven away and gone. Damn, I should have just like Let's get out there. Ten, well, ten minutes, like the waves are like tiny. I could have just taken the longboard out and. Yeah. C- connected for 10 minutes and it would have changed my whole day my ears have grown closed growing up in Cape Town with the cold water and the wind and it's like I have to like ration my surfs because my ears I wear plugs all the time but it's it makes me so sad because but that's kind of how I got to this place because <laughs> we'll just jump out there for three I can't surf without earplugs if I surf without earplugs my ears are sore for a week really yeah Yeah. which ones do you wear the docks oh okay the vented docks oh okay yep that's what I've um, I used to prefer Surf Ears yep. version 1 oh right the blue and black ones yeah they were the best but they don't make them anymore yeah that's hard to find out yeah the second version it just doesn't fit my ear that well so I've gone to the docks and they don't s- necessarily stop all the water going in because they are vented yeah. but they stop the water getting pressurised all the way behind the eardrum yeah I think that's the difference and now. when Surfer's Ear what Surfer's Ear is trying to do is it's, it's bone growing over the, the, the whole of the ear so that it's so small but the dock's plug, that's exactly what it is. It's giving you that tiny little hole, enough for sound to come in, but not enough for lots of water pressure to go in. Sure. And, that, and, and of course the wind as well. It's actually the, the bone grows, grows over because of the wind. I think, it's that, I think it's that combination with the wind. Cause yeah. Like say but, but truck drivers get it. That's right. That's why I'm thinking the wind is, and I've heard this obviously as well, but um, yeah, like riding the bike down to lowers, it's like... I'll leave my plugs in on the windy days back home just because that's as bad, you know? Mm. Yeah. Yeah, it's... Uh, I w- I'd definitely surf more if my ears weren't an issue, so... Yeah, it might be your music background might have something to do with that too. Yeah, I just... Lots of loud music in the past. Y- yeah, I, d- I don't know. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard. I'd definitely swim and surf. I, st- I kind of stopped body surfing for a long time because, man, I'd spend so much time body surfing and n- now it's like, oh, it's... It's risky on the ears, and then just a few weeks ago at the Cosmic Creek, had a little demonstration session there, and ended up swimming out with uh, Mark Cunningham in particular, and it was such an honour to obviously swim with him. But yeah, I just gotten back into like I'm like longing to go body surfing more, you know, and it's hard on the ears, but man, it's such a beautiful activity. <laughs> it makes so much sense, you know. Back to the podcast. You've entered the podcast world. Yeah. yeah. What's the show called? The show is called Swell With My Soul. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, it's actually, it actually ties in with what we were saying. It's like, they, I, I feel like the discussions we have about surfboards and surfing and life and how surfing fills and fits in within my life and people's lives and the designs in between, it's it's um, it's all the same stuff, you know? So, you know, the ups and downs of life and the currents and the swells, It's it just sort of makes, makes sense. And you know what is surfing what is your soul <laughs> who are we what are we trying to do i'm i definitely don't s- didn't and hope not to set out with any answers but really enjoy wrestling with the questions you know um i approach life that way cuz i feel it's more fascinating uh, but uh yeah i i really i'm fascinated by what i've learned only because of what I could learn next, not how much I know. And yeah, I just think for me it was to to be 100% honest, it's a selfish motivation to both share these things, but to learn from people. Like it's amazing what you learn having a conversation about all sorts of things from someone. And and it, I think it's just for what's where you're at in that time and what's fitting for that day. Um, so yeah, it's... Uh, Early days, but it's fun to share. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it is. So, swell with my soul. iTunes. Yeah, on iTunes. So uh, I'm under the Surf Splendor Network, and they've been really good to include me there. And yeah, um, they're helping in some of the production and that kind of stuff. So yeah, hopefully we'll be able to do a little dual podcast launch on this or something. But um, yeah, it's it's so n- I, I I'm so honoured that I get to. I, I'm drowning out noise all day. Not when I'm designing, drawing outlines and so on and so forth, but the rest of the time, I mean, I pretty much put a curriculum together of things I'd like to learn and podcasts have been so, so helpful in, in putting together a little glossary of 
what to learn next and um I think the conversations and and what seems to be boiling to the surface is people really want detailed discussions on like actual numbers on surfboards and I'm happy to share anything I've learned and if it's helpful for someone that's great I do, definitely don't know it all but I'm trying to learn every day but it's it's funny how much you'd think that people won't really want to get into the nitty of like fin angles and actual wide points and where the dimensions are but there seems to be a demand so definitely going to add to that and um yeah share anything we're learning along the way yeah well on that note if anyone's listening and has any feedback if we touched on something people want to know more about let us know yeah and i th- i think that's one of the visions i feel like you know I must be 100% honest, I don't have time to sit and go through comment sections and reply to, like, there's more than enough work to do at the best of times and just keep the whole thing afloat, you know. I hand shape every surfboard I sell. It's, it's there's a lot of work going on and I enjoy doing it, but there are questions that are going to boil up and there's going to be things that people want to go into in a deeper setting. And one of the visions is, you know, maybe it's an annual event it's a it's a q and a open evening and and i've ha- i've done certain things like this around the world when i get to shape and do events with Vistler and so on and so forth and it's like you have these beautiful question and answer evenings just around a few surfboards and there's power in that and one of the visions would be like imagine in a year like going through the last year of surf podcasts that you've hosted and what are the questions and i don't know i, I just i see I like that we get to listen in private and I like that you can be at the gym or driving or doing whatever you want, but there is a sense of community that one needs to build and there's a camaraderie that can go along with a brand like you're building and I think that's the, the there's still a second element to that which can, I don't, I don't know the shape or form of it yet, but that's going to be interesting and I, I'm excited to actually see that, I think it's just naturally going to blossom and come into its own. Yeah, yeah, it's a cool, I love the medium podcast, it's a great medium, and surfing is a great topic. Yeah, well, what's funny about it is, I don't think that it's only for people who surf. I mean, why do you say that? Because of the, so for me, uh, okay, for instance, I understood that the mental fortitude in trying to learn something and having to stay focused on a task while you're learning something is is, is huge importance it's ubiquitous yeah yes so to try and surf better and as a personal home team building exercise I started playing tennis with my wife once a week and I went to the thrift store and we got old wooden tennis rackets because I wanted to lower the perform. and we're not tennis players and we've gotten way better every week on a Sunday afternoon we'll go play tennis but it was a great exercise to see, okay, can I apply my mind? So it had nothing to do with surfing except it was all the same disciplines. Okay, I'm working on an entirely different hand-eye coordination activity, but mentally I could break down the technique. So it helped when I go out and surf, and it's like, okay. And I think Clayton was talking about putting those, um, those uh, what, did, what did he say, those mental mental um, cheat words or... Q words or something like yeah, that. Something yeah, something like that, but like... Oh, he's probably pulling his hair out. <laughs> Sorry, buddy. <laughs> Just a word, something, something to remind you to focus on one thing. Yeah, like little flashcards, um, trigger yeah. words. Trigger words. There we it. go. We yeah. got it finally. And and so I was like, okay, well, let's go into an entirely different discipline and get those trigger words. And I've learned so much through other podcasts that have nothing to do with surfing, but I can apply it to my craft as a craftsman, then also to my surfing. So it's all the same stuff. So there's an overlap there that you can't dictate or even manage, which is, that's the beauty of the thing. You want to surf better? Learn to knit. Why? I don't know, but I bet you it'll make you surf differently. I mean, come on, you're like you can't measure this stuff, but it's, it can't not be happening. It's all... I agree, man. Like if you can, We've all had that experience when time slows down. Yeah. And that's oh. what it's about. If time slows down, you, you take in more information, you make a better decision. It's that simple. Gosh. And that's, that is ubiquitous. Yeah. Every single professional athlete knows how to slow time down that's not the right way to put it but they they know how to f- tune in to the finer details yeah. and that's the illusion of time slowing down it's just you're processing more information you're focused on the now or on the center of now yeah more specifically yeah that flow state huh yeah 
I've been uh, listening to uh, Finding Mastery, which is Michael Gervais, and I I don't know if it's just more recent that I'm getting to that state more often when I surf, but I I actually said to my wife just a few days ago, I was like, man, I, I hate, I don't wear a watch, I, like I just hate being tied to something like that and having something else on. I was like, I, I think I need to get a watch because often I have a little window to go surf, Often I don't, and that's a luxury, which is great. But I lit—I literally have lost track of time lately. Just unlocking a board, and next thing, like the wind stops, and five people get out, and the next thing, it's just two or three of you out there, and you get this opportunity to work on fins or whatever it is, and absolutely lost all sense of time. Not being irresponsible, but just you get into this rhythm with the sets and pushing off a board, like that wooden board sitting right there. I. I felt I felt like I'd surf for forty five minutes and it was two hours and fifteen minutes. I, I was blindsided. I I could and and it was overcast, so the evening light like you couldn't see the sun setting and it just it felt brighter than it was and yeah, that was I I had to fire off a text. That's what like we're that's what we're searching for, man. Yeah, it yeah. was really a beautiful I mean, thing. How long do you think we've been talking for? Uh okay. Kinda getting used to the podcast thing is uh probably hour twenty four. So hour fifty. Whoa, 25 minutes, that's a huge So we've never, n- nearly done two hours. That is ridiculous. Yeah, time goes fast. Yeah, and I think for podcasting, it's great because if you don't like, just turn it off. You don't yeah. have to listen to this. Of course. But there's something to having a long conversation. Now, that's why I think we're supposed to eat dinners together. You're like, you know, it takes a long time and you eventually get to places where you wouldn't have just, you know, like a little stab in the dark. Oh, wrong words. <laughs> but uh, poke in the side. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, you're right. Yeah, we wouldn't. Yeah, there's probably a lot of people that in the first 20 minutes of this conversation dropped off because we were just kind of finding our way. But if they stuck through it, then. That's what a podcast is, I think. Yeah. yeah. Like, look at Joe Rogan. A lot of them, are like, they start off, but the next thing you know, it's a, it's a three hour podcast. That's how you surf, too. I actually had a really interesting conversation with my brother in law. And, um,. He was like, do you ever just have like a bad surf and you just can't get in the rhythm? I was like, yeah, absolutely. But I've realized my, I I can feel it happening straight away. And then I'm like, okay, how quickly can I reset? And the goal is then to like be able to get yourself back in and then turn it into the good one. And it's, it's mentally too, but like next thing and, and how often I've now turned when I just feel off into magic sessions, man, and it's such an exercise, but you, you, I, I don't know what it is. You just find your groove again, and I think it's different every time. But just being intuitive to what that thing is and how to respond, yeah. Yeah, well, part of the there's a sequence of a, of events you have to go through to get into the flow or the zone. Okay. And one one of the things that you usually need to go through. It's not, it's not always the case, but um, we use it to help people to like to kind of open the floodgates towards getting deeper into flow more is the the concept of struggle mm. so so sometimes it's like especially if the waves are big and it's like oh man okay I'm, i made it out the back i was like just you just famished but then a wave comes you just spin and go without thought mm. and then warm then you're in the zone it's that struggle phase and then the like in training when i'm training people we, we use that as well okay you're gonna go you're gonna f- five minutes on the bike as hard as you can and then we're going to go re- visual reaction and decision making af- after you've been through that struggle mm. so that can it's a, it, w- when you struggle physically through something yeah there's a whole bunch of neurochemistry that happens that 100 percent agree yeah that that that's more con- and that neurochemistry is more conducive to flow sometimes flow just happens right oh. like you're sitting at the back talking to someone and then all of a sudden there's a set wave, no one's on it, and you spin and go, and you're like, boom, 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 pull off the wave and go, what happened there? Yeah, you can't even remember what you did on the wave. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. And it's just like, you're so outside of yourself. So, so sometimes flow can be completely spontaneous like that. Sure. Hmm. So to that point, so, uh, yeah, when they had that, uh, was it the Founders Cup at the pool? I didn't watch it because it was the boardroom show weekend, but over the highlights and just listening to a little bit of the feedback from that, I was like... I might be way off here, but if I was a coach, it seemed like one of the best things you could have made those guys do is paddle between waves because that's probably the most unfamiliar part was standing in ankle deep or knee deep water waiting for a wave to that like your mental game would just be 
You've never done that. Not a wave that size. And it's like, I was just thinking about that cardio rhythm, like, because I've really worked on my paddling, like how to paddle a surfboard, let alone into a wave. That's been also learned from your um, platform. And um, wow, with Rob Case and some of those interviews, but like literally before you even caught a wave, that's why you can just feel the flow. So I'm always thinking about boards and the, and the whole design thing, but like, before you've even caught a wave, you're you're starting to get in tune with your parameters, you know, and your your breathing and everything's happening. And I was like, wow, these guys have been surfing every day for 20 years, and now you've taken out one. It's like taking your shoes off as a runner. <laughs> it's yeah, you it's can a good still point. run, but I, I was looking at that, but maybe because I was over analyzing it, going like, what would I have done as a coach? Because it was a m- huge mental game, wasn't it? seven with the t like everything had changed but maybe that was one of the little things you know yeah i mean yeah that we the variables a lot of the variables were thrown aw- thrown away yeah and you added some new ones and then those probably became the focal elements huh yeah and some people basically choked they did yeah <laughs> parko john john choked like two of the best in the world and then paige harab got into the zone yeah for example she was like the underdog and the world team essentially was the underdog and they did so well so Mm. yeah i feel like maybe it's just where i'm living and what i'm trying to do but i feel like the future is being able to get into the zone and surfing really well in small bad waves just because it's i love the concept of really good big powerful barreling like i I mean that's still going to be the ultimate dream but i mean that is this is not every day I know what you're saying. Like you see a pro surfing one foot slop, and you're just like, "What? Yeah. Can it be that fun? Wow! Yeah. I, I How do I do that? Because I think if you do that, then when you get a half a chance to get barreled again, and it's like, oh, I think I can figure this one out, you know? Yeah. I, I really putting all my emphasis and effort and focus on, on that part of what surfing is. I feel like it's. It can never not be part of the future of surfing, whichever way it goes and whichever way it progresses, but that really challenging, small, weird, hard to ride. Hmm. Yeah. What's your website for the boards? The website is brinksurf.com. So B-R-I-N-K-S-U-R-F.com. Yeah. That's all about the change right now, to be honest. Got a couple things coming up and it's it's been hard. It's been good. It served a good purpose, but... Um, I'm actually limiting the amount of things I'm making. Just, uh, it's confusing for people and it's served a good purpose in terms of showing variety of things you're working on. And if you really want one, you can hit me up and we'll build you whatever you want. That's one of the joys of what I do. But limiting things to really focusing on certain design elements, I think there's definite parts of surfboards that are missing in people's either quiver or any availability at retail or you know that kind of thing so i'm working on things that fascinate me and that i'm testing and um things that i really believe in and that i don't have to explain as much and if you want one i'll build you one (laughs) because the podcast's a great way to have these conversations about volume so if we can have you really thinking about all these things and not have to go through all these things for every order it's not because they don't matter but you can pick up kind of where we've left the conversations off. So, yeah, Donald Brink on Instagram. Um, yeah, there's always little things coming out there. And, yeah. Cool, man. Yeah, it's it's fun. Thank <laughs> you for, for your time. We'll do it oh, again sometime. Thank you. I'd love it. It's um, I'm going to report back and tell you how I've gone from <laughs> from over <laughs> overthinking the, the power flow to the bring the nimbleness back into my surfing. So, yeah, I'm looking forward to hearing as a challenge how you unlocking that bottom turn into the small wave yeah I'm working on it yeah I think it's powerful I'd like to hear and I think other people would like to hear too and that's one thing too it's like having feedback along the way and let the podcast sort of roll out on itself like I've learned a lot about surfing by just having a mental game plan on what I'm trying to do with my surfing but also for a specific session after a recent uh, episode I did with Dan Gadaskis after his Fiji waves and like 
that was fun. Mm-hmm. So that's always going to be part of the conversation with with reference to something we've learned together and then we move on. So yeah, thanks for having me part of your platform and yeah, kind of odd to talk this much. <laughs> <laughs> it's awesome. Thank you. Oh, thanks, Appreciate bro. it. Yeah. Cool. See ya. <laughs>